When I say the word righteous, I wonder what neural pathways fire for you. What do you think that word means and what comes to mind for you? Well, I think for most of us here who have had the benefit of a lot of biblical and theological study, we probably think of righteous, righteousness primarily in Pauline terms, the beautiful truth of, of what we call imputation, that the righteousness that is Jesus's gets credited to us by virtue of our union with Him. But if we took a few minutes and gathered into groups, I think we could come up with a broader definition of righteousness as well, because actually in the Bible, the word righteousness is used in a lot of ways. It certainly is used in the sense of imputation, but it also means that maybe in its most natural sense, especially in the Old Testament and into the New, of, of holiness or purity or just doing what is right, doing God's will. In fact, the idea of righteousness is actually very big in the Bible, and it's a lot more complicated than we sometimes realize. Big words often function in many ways. Well, for me, it's a great joy and privilege to be spending a lot of time for these last 20 years or so in the wonderful Gospel of Matthew, both studying it and teaching it and preaching it. As Dr. Hall said, I'm on a preaching staff at Sojourn East, and we're preaching through Matthew right now, and it's great. And whether you're preaching or teaching or studying in Matthew, sooner or later you realize that Matthew cares a lot about this idea of righteousness. In fact, he talks about it several times and in a very specific way, including in some really famous and, and kind of challenging verses like Matthew 5.20 in the Sermon on the Mount when he says, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. So it's a big deal for Matthew. In fact, it's such a big deal in Matthew that once we see it, we realize, and we maybe shouldn't be surprised, that it actually occurs in the very first story in the Gospel of Matthew. The idea of righteousness is in the very first story. You have the genealogy in the first 17 verses, and then the very first story, the idea of righteousness occurs. If you have a Bible, I'd encourage you to look there. You may not actually see it in your translation. In the ESV, it translates it as just. In the NIV, it translates it as faithful to the law. But in verse 19 of Matthew chapter 1, it talks about righteousness. And even though you and I may be familiar with the term righteous, we're going to see that in Matthew's hands, it doesn't quite mean what I think we assume it means. In fact, he's going to use this story and the rest of his gospel to define righteousness in a very particular and pointed way. But we're not there yet. I want to get there. First, we need to see what is the story that he tells. So if you look again in, in a Bible there at Matthew 1, I want to look at Matthew 1, 18 to 25. Now, our Gospels, these great gifts to us, are theological biographies. They are a biography, and when you tell a story of, of a person, you typically start with an origin story that is explaining who the person is that the biography is about, their people and their birth and place. Mark doesn't do that. Matthew and Luke do. They tell us these origin stories, as you, knew, as you know. And in Matthew, we actually don't have anything about Jesus' actual birth, those stories actually come in Luke. In Matthew, he chooses to tell us some other parts of the origin story of Jesus. And Matthew tells us these other important things that happen. And in fact, in this first story, it's taking place about seven or eight months before Jesus is born. And the characters are the same people we meet in Luke, but different story. We meet Mary and Joseph and an angel. And look with me at verse 18 the second half of it. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Now, one of the things about Matthew, I love novels. I, I read tons of fiction all the time. And one of the things, I love Matthew too, but I, I, I wish Matthew loved telling a better story. He actually doesn't care much about telling a very good story. When you compare Matthew and Mark in the same accounts, usually Matthew... He, doesn't, he takes out almost all the details, and he just gets right to the point. And so too here. There's no tension of the buildup. He just does this manuscript drop right from the beginning. He says, here's the story about Jesus. First story I'm going to tell you, Mary's betrothed. She's not yet married to Joseph, and she's pregnant. And it's by the Holy Spirit. So it's a very intense, like no buildup of tension right from the beginning. And there's a few things we need to understand about what's behind this very short but very pregnant verse. 
And that is that according to the customs of the day, of course, marriages were arranged beforehand. It's a contractual agreement between a man who desires to be married. So he makes this arrangement with the young woman's father. And then there's a time period of a betrothal before they come together where the contractual obligations have to be fulfilled. And then finally, the young woman would move into his house And that period of betrothal, it could last for a year or so before they actually cohabitated, which is evidently the situation in the story. They're already betrothed, and it's during this waiting time that it would not be inappropriate even to divorce someone or to send some away, um, breaking off the betrothal for some reason. Well, the tension of our story is that during this this betrothal period, before the consummation of the marriage, Mary turns out to be pregnant. And we do not know how far along in the pregnancy she, she was. We don't know how widespread the knowledge became. It seems it must not have been too far along in that Joseph had plans to get, to put her aside, to divorce her quietly, verse 19 says, in hopes that people wouldn't notice this mess. And it is, in fact, a huge mess. And then look what happens in verse 19. Mary is in a particularly horrible situation. Imagine yourself. No rights. She's heading towards shame. She's heading towards ostracism, possibly even stoning if the religious extremists get a hold of her. Her life is over. And in the midst of this mess, Joseph is a good man. Rather than denounce Mary and shame her, Joseph does something amazing. He makes plans to end their betrothal and send Mary away quietly so that she's not disgraced or even killed. He has all the power here. And he is the one, so it appears by anybody's standards, who has been dishonored and wronged. He made this contractual agreement. She was betrothed to him, and now she turns out to be pregnant. She has clearly broken the deal. He is is in the right. She is in the wrong. And yet he chooses to send her away quietly. If you can imagine yourself in either of these situations, very stressful, very painful, very fearful very confusing. I mean, people talk. People calculate conception dates, right? I mean, Mary and Joseph, if they, even if they went ahead and get, got married, people would figure out that there was something awry here. There's no reason to think, actually, that Mary and Joseph ever conversed after her pregnancy was discovered. Men and women didn't usually interact socially like that very much. So she probably never even had a chance to offer her very fishy-sounding explanation (laughs) that an angel appeared to me, right? So Joseph probably just assumed that the pregnancy occurred maybe during Mary's, remember she, for three months, Luke tells us, Luke 1, she disappeared because she went and and visited her cousin, right? So maybe he's assuming, I think, a natural assumption that she got pregnant during that time. All that Matthew indicates is that Joseph decided to show incredible mercy to Mary, protecting her even in the midst of this injustice that had been done against him as far as he can tell. And then, in verses 20 and 21, something amazing happens. You can look there. An angel, probably Gabriel, who visited Zechariah and Mary and Luke, an angel appears to him in a dream, to Joseph. And of course, the appearance of an angel in the Bible is always a clear sign of some new work of God. Angelical appearances in the Bible are not overly common, and they're always accompanied by some significant message about a new work of God. And the angel's words to Joseph contain an explanation a command, and a revelation. Look at them there. The explanation is what Mary already knew, but Joseph didn't, that her pregnancy was actually not the result of sin and unfaithfulness on her part, but instead was begotten by the Holy Spirit. The command was to Joseph not to fear. It's interesting to consider again why the angel would tell Joseph not to fear. 
Now, that is, of course, a, a very common word whenever an angel appears to tell people not to be afraid. But this is more explicit. It says, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. Why would Joseph be afraid to take Mary as his wife? Well, it seems that I, I think as an upright Jewish man, he would have been concerned about being defiled by her and by this marriage. No, it's not a category we use very much and don't really think in categories, but this is part of most ancient people's experience and certainly in, in, the, in the Bible that there's this idea of clean and unclean. And I think he would have been afraid that he is entering into an unclean situation. And the angel says, do not be afraid because that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. So you have no reason to fear. This is God's work. So there's an explanation, a command, and then look at the revelation in verse 21. Mary is going to give birth to a boy, and you are going to name him Jesus. That is the Greek form Yeshua or Joshua from the Old Testament. Why? Why name him Joshua or Jesus? This is an abbreviation for Yahweh saves. And just like in the Exodus with Moses and Joshua, this Jesus, the angel tells Joseph, is going to rescue his people from the consequences of their sins. A crazy thing to say in already this crazy situation. And then look, let your eyes jump ahead to verses 24 and 25 and see how our story ends. Super short story. How's it end? Once again, Matthew doesn't do much drama in his stories. He just tells us what's happened. Joseph woke up. He did what the angel told him to do. He married Mary. He brought her into his home, though he and Mary didn't consummate their marriage. Joseph protected her, provided her in every other way. Then it came to an end with the birth of a son. They named him Jesus. End of story. That's it. There was really not many verses at all for all these events. It's a very quick story. So the story that begins the New Testament, let that sink in. This is the story that begins the New Testament is as short as it is shocking. And what in the world does it mean and why does God put this here to start off the New Testament? It's an easy story just to blow by and forget. Well, it's important to understand something about all the stories in the Gospels and that is that all the stories in the Gospels tell us something both about God and about ourselves. All the stories of the Gospels reveal something about God, and they invite us to understand, to identify, to understand something about ourselves in the characters. So what does this story tell us about God, and what does it tell us about ourselves? Well, let's start with God. Always a good place to start. We've already mentioned that the first thing that this story tells us about God, it's what the angel said, that Jesus is actually the incarnation, the in-flesh reality of God coming to rescue and save his people from the consequences of our sins. That's what verse 21 says. And we cannot and should not miss that part of the story. If we don't catch it clearly here at the beginning, Matthew's going to spend the rest of the story showing that this is what Jesus has come to do, to rescue his people from the consequences of their sins. He says the same thing all the way through, and especially, of course, in the last few chapters of the gospel where the whole story comes to an end, where Jesus offers himself as a sacrifice, as verse 26, 28, chapter 26, 28 says, for the forgiveness of sins. But to understand this a bit more, we need to pay attention to the two verses I skipped over, and that's verses 22 and 23. If you look at those, you'll see that Matthew, and I don't have time to get into all this, I wish I could, take my class and we'll talk about this stuff more, but all five of these stories at the beginning have the same word in them, and it's here in this first one as well, and that's the word fulfillment. Matthew explains that all this stuff that just happened in the story is actually the fulfillment of what God has been doing in the past. And he quotes, here's what it says, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. The first thing to notice is obviously that what Jesus means by fulfilling and what Matthew means by fulfilling doesn't always mean an exact prediction. Sometimes it does, but not always. A lot of times it means there's an analogy, there's a, there's a figural connection. And he's saying this story about Mary and Joseph 
ties into a verse from Isaiah by connecting it to the idea of a virgin bearing a son. But notice one thing that's different, that's analogous, not prediction, is the name. I mean, Joseph and Mary don't name him Emmanuel. They name him Jesus, right? And so, which is what the angel told them to do. So whatever fulfillment means, it doesn't only mean just an exact prediction or else they named him the wrong thing, right, according to Isaiah 7. What it's meant to say is that there's a greater reality that we understand when we take all these things together. And here's what I mean. When you and I think of the idea of Jesus saving us from our sins, we have been taught primarily to think of that with a courtroom or legal image, like a judge proclaiming that we're not guilty of sins in a court or legal sense. That's absolutely true and biblical. That's just not quite the image that's going on here. The idea is that Jesus is being sent like Joshua to save or rescue us from our sins in a particular way. The idea of rescuing us from bondage, from slavery, from oppression. It's like we've been kidnapped and then there's this special ops team that breaks in and rescues us. Like we've been captured as slaves and someone bursts in and breaks our bonds and brings us to freedom. This is what saved means. It means you've been rescued from something. It's not primarily a a legal image, it's primarily an action image of being rescued. And the idea of Jesus coming to save us from our sins and tying it to Isaiah is of course tied to the great hope of the book of Isaiah and all throughout the Old Testament that God is going to return to rescue his people from the bondage that we're in to our own sin. As Isaiah 40 says, Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned. Go up on a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up, fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. Behold, the Lord God comes with might. His arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. The point is, and the summary of all this is, that God coming and and. Begot, begetting Jesus through this woman Mary is a picture of mercy. It's a picture of and a reality of mercy. Mercy is seeing someone in need and coming to rescue and help them whether it's financially or car trouble or the enslaved or the oppressed and whether the person has inflicted this on themselves or not, mercy shows up and rescues people. And this is exactly the image that God is being presented as, that he is going to rescue his people from their sins, and that is the greatest act of mercy. And I would just say to you, friends, behold your God. If you get nothing else from our time today, please hear me, you did not make yourself You cannot sustain your own life. All the power and control and authority you think you have, we are but a vapor. But the one who made you and sustains you, whether you know him or not, whether you care about him or not, whether you hate him or love him, whether you don't know what to think, this God sees you, he knows you, and he relates to you with mercy. Mercy. That's how he reveals himself as merciful in this very first story of the New Testament that God is going to come and rescue to deliver people from bondage. He knows your brokenness. He knows your needs. He knows your disappointments. He knows your longings and yearnings, your confusion. And he says, look, I'm coming now into the world. I am here. I am glad to show you mercy. I am making all things new through the giving of my own son to rescue you. So the first and most important thing that would be so easy to just read over these verses too quickly and miss is that God is stepping into our brokenness as a picture of mercy. So we should always start there. What does it say about God? But that's not all the Bible speaks. The Bible constantly invites us to consider ourselves then in light of this, to to look at our own lives both outside and inside. It's not so that we have to be overly 
filled with shame or defeated, but to remember that God's revelation of himself is an invitation to pay attention to ourselves. And you see, God's rescue is, is not just initial, but it's, it's setting us into a new life. It's setting us into a new way. To be saved from our sins is to take us from one way into another way. And so it's appropriate that we look at the people in the stories and ask, how can we learn about ourselves from them? We have two characters in our, in our story, of course, and for whatever reason, Matthew doesn't shine the spotlight on Mary. That's what Luke does. Luke talks a lot about Mary, and Joseph's not really a character there. And here, Matthew invites us to consider the man Joseph, to consider him and what he teaches us at the beginning of the New Testament. And what is it? What is Joseph's role? What does Joseph reveal about us? Well, it's easy to miss, but it's crucial. Look back at verse 19 with me, and then think back to what I asked at the beginning, what does righteous mean? And look what verse 19 says. Joseph is the first person in the New Testament who, and in fact, a pretty rare person, who's described as righteous. He's described as the kind of person who God looks upon and says, this person is righteous. Of the kind of person God looks upon and says, not that he's free or perfect from sin, but that he or she understands and is aligned with me. That's what is declared about him. He's a righteous person or just person. And we don't really know much about Joseph. We don't know his age or his appearance or whether he was good at guitar or anything. We don't really know anything. But we know from God's perspective that God thought he was righteous. That's remarkable. Now, here's what's amazing. What does God think Joseph's righteousness looks like? What is this story showing us about what righteousness looks like in God's eyes? What's the logic of verse 19? Well, some of your translations do a better job than others, <clears throat> but I'm confident that the idea is this. Because Joseph was a righteous person, he decided to show mercy. Because Joseph was a righteous person, he decided to show mercy. You want the technical? I think it's a causal participle. There's your chapel version of it. I don't say that in the at Sojourn East, but there's your chapel version of it. This is a causal participle, I would suggest to you. Your translation probably does what I call the third down punt, which is being righteous, right? But I think contextually it's pretty obvious that this is intending to say because he was righteous. In other words, Joseph's righteousness is incarnated and explained through his merciful and compassionate attitude toward his apparently unfaithful fiance. Joseph is righteous in the way that Jesus will define righteousness. And if all we had was, these, was this verse... Maybe you could debate what kind of participle it is, but if you read Matthew faithfully and carefully over and over, you will see that this is exactly how Jesus is going to define righteousness over and over as being merciful. Rather than dragging Mary before the village and demanding her stoning or other punishment, the wrongly treated Joseph, so it appears, desires to not put her to shame but rather to end their betrothal with a quiet, unexplained termination, even when he still thinks it's all Mary's fault. You have to remember, when he decides to do that, he, the angel has not yet appeared to him. This is not a function of the angel telling him this. He decides to do this before he even knows <clears throat> that she is not wrong. Some decades later, the adult Jesus will commend the very virtue that Joseph manifests here. For example, 
in Matthew 5, 7 when he says, blessed are the merciful. Or in 9, 13 or 12, 7 where he quotes Hosea 6, 6 saying that God desires mercy that is compassion towards others, not just sacrifice. Or when he talks about practicing your righteousness in secret rather than for the praise of others in chapter 6. All of those are being exemplified by Joseph right here at the beginning. In other words, when you pay attention to how math, to, in Matthew to how God presents righteousness as modeled, first of all, here in Joseph, it turns out, if you will read Matthew carefully, that showing mercy, forgiving each other's sins, showing compassion towards others as a repeated theme may be summed up best in what, when Jesus is asked, what's the greatest commandment? To love God, and then he adds, to love your neighbor as yourself. In all these things, Jesus is saying, this is what true righteousness looks like. It primarily looks like mercy. And now, can you begin to see how all of this fits together? There's an organic, intentional connection between both aspects of the story, the the part about God and the part about us, that God is merciful in coming to rescue us when we were dead and not deserving, and so is Joseph in seeking to rescue and spare Mary when she has wronged him, so it appears, and so should we be. As God is shown to be merciful in coming and being present and forgiving and rescuing us from our sinful and desperate situation, so is Joseph toward Mary, and so too should we with Joseph and later Jesus as our model. We're being invited into this same way of being with each other. This is an invitation to learn something that's very unnatural to us to learn to be merciful toward each other. This means compassionate actions on behalf of someone in need, even if you think they deserve it. Even if they've gotten themselves into some messy situation for the 50th time, to be a righteous person is to show mercy. Even, Jesus will say, if they are your enemy, to not gloat in their downfall, to not gloat or be happy in their difficulties, but to show mercy. Even if you are of a different class or race or educational level or culture or ethnicity, to show mercy. And this is beautiful, but it's very difficult. It's so difficult to be merciful to others because There's another thing in us that is right and good, and that's justice. Justice is good and right from God. God gives us a sense of right and wrong at the creational level. Now, it often gets distorted, and anyone who thinks they're operating in justice needs to check themselves often, but it is in us. And so mercy can sometimes feel like the opposite of justice. People not getting what they deserved, but helping them, even if it's their fault and in a bad place. But you need to notice that we all love justice when it's applied to other people, but we all love mercy when it's applied to us. Especially if someone has wronged us, we love the tasty poison of justice in the form of vengeance. And vengeance feels so good for a while, it scratches an itch that's the will to punish others. But vengeance is the Lord's, not ours. God alone is the judge. Judge not lest you be judged, as Jesus is going to teach. But we love mercy. We love mercy when we are in need, and so we should love giving mercy to others who are in need. Joseph felt the need for justice and vengeance, I'm sure. So does God. But the greater virtue than justice is mercy. When I think of the modern experience of mercy, 
I think one of the most powerful examples, I always think of the bishop and priest from the beginning of Les Mis. You remember this? Maybe you've seen the musical version or, or the, uh, one of the film versions, Bishop Muriel, or read the book. If you've seen the musical or the movie, you know who I'm talking about. If not, I can very briefly explain. When, when the main character, Jean Valjean, has gotten out of prison and he's traveling and he's desperate and he's starving, Bishop Muriel welcomes him into his home and he feeds him and he gives him a place to sleep. And then that night, Valjean steals the bishop's valuable silver goblets and flees. And later, the police catch Valjean on the road. They drag him back to the bishop to return the silver and to verify that Valjean is the thief. And, and that means he's going to go back to the prison for the rest of his life. His life is over. And do you remember what the bishop does? Instead, with great mercy, the bishop says, no, no, I, I gave the silver to Valjean. And in fact, he says to Valjean, here, you forgot to take the most important pieces, and he gives him the silver candlesticks as well. And Valjean is then freed and set on his way with this great treasure. Then if you know the story, that's what enables him to start a new and prosperous life and then to be this beautiful person who ends up rescuing and serving so many others. It's such a powerful scene. And in the musical version, the bishop sings these lines to Valjean. I will not sing them for you, although that would be enjoyable. <laughs> I'll read them for you. Go watch the musical version. He says, I have to resist. Don't sing it. Okay, here we go. I'll just say them. <laughs> but remember this, my brother. See in this some higher plan. You must use this precious silver to become an honest man. By the witness of the martyrs, by the passion and the blood, God has raised you out of darkness. I have bought your soul for God. Friends, that's mercy. That is the power of mercy to coming to someone who's in need, who did not deserve it, and in mercy, it transforms us to be beautiful people who show mercy to others. That's how Joseph treated Mary. What about you? Let me pray. Thank you, God, for kindness toward us in all of our brokenness and all of our mistakes, stupid things we say and do and foolishness, moments of, of arrogance and self-righteousness and just blatant sin and all these things, God, you look upon us with mercy and I'm thankful for that. I need your mercy. I pray that you'd make me and make my brothers and sisters here, make our community one that is marked by the beauty and goodness of how you are. And I pray these things in Jesus' powerful name. Amen.